Japan says China's chip industry is dead. They are wrong. The $100 billion mistake. How sanctions created a monster. Listen. If you've only been following the news coming out of Japan, or reading the headlines from certain Western mainstream media, you might think this game is already over. The narrative being repeated goes like this. The United States, acting as the director, has teamed up with Japan and the Netherlands to build an insurmountable, silicon curtain, across the Pacific. I in this script. Japan controls the lifeline of chemical materials, the Netherlands holds the keys to the lithography machines, and the US controls the underlying logic of EDA design software. And on the other side of that wall, China is portrayed as being locked in the Stone Age. They are described as a group of followers who can only copy, destined to never build top tier chips, and forever excluded from the so-called circle of civilization. Japanese media have even confidently asserted that this technological gap isn't temporary. It's a permanent, structural chasm. But what if I told you that's only half the story? What if I told you that while the whole world is staring at that locked front door, China has been quietly digging a trillion-dollar tunnel right under the wall? According to the latest data from Bloomberg and internal reports from Semi, Semiconductor Equipment and Materials International, something startling is happening. This isn't just about chip technology anymore. This is a story about arrogance, about miscalculation, and about one of the biggest boomerang effects in geopolitical history. Today, we are going to peel back the layers of the news cycle and deconstruct this invisible war. First, we have to give Japan some respect. We need to acknowledge the facts. Seriously, on this planet, without Japanese technology, your iPhone, your Tesla, and even that smart fridge in your kitchen probably wouldn't work. The confidence of the Japanese media isn't groundless. Think of it like cooking a three-star Michelin meal. Maybe China can manufacture the pots and pans now, but Japan holds the essential, spices, and the secret recipes. This is what we call technological ecological dominance. Specifically, we are talking about invisible giants like Tokyo Electron and Shinetsu Chemical. In processes that sound boring but are absolutely critical, like film deposition and coding development, Japan is almost a monopoly. Take photoresist, for example. It's a magical liquid coated onto silicon wafers, requiring a purity of 99.9999%. Without it, a $100 million lithography machine is just a pile of scrap metal. In this sector, Japanese companies occupy over 90% of the global high-end market share. That is a terrifying level of dominance. So, when Japan joined the US-led Advanced Semiconductor Alliance, their logic was very clear, perhaps even unassailable. In the eyes of Tokyo's decision-makers, the semiconductor industry is an extremely complex pyramid. They are at the apex, holding the underlying codes of physics and chemistry. In their view, even if China throws hundreds of billions of dollars into their big fun, they can only buy cold, hard equipment. They can't buy the process know-how that requires decades of accumulated experience. They believe China has no friends, no allies, and is stuck hovering at the low end. This is typical, static thinking, or inventory thinking. They see technological barriers as a static wall, a moat accumulated over decades. How could anyone possibly cross it in just a few years? This view is very popular in Tokyo. They believe China has been kicked out of the Premier League, forced to play pickup games in their backyard, never to play in the World Cup again. But there is a massive blind spot here. They have underestimated the explosive power of survival, and they have underestimated China's speed. Here comes the twist. While all the spotlights are focused on 7 nanometer, 5 nanometer, or even 3 nanometer cutting edge processes, and while everyone is debating the yield rates of TSMC and Samsung, China made an extremely pragmatic, perhaps even cunning, strategic choice. They didn't try to immediately smash their heads against the thickest part of the wall. Instead, they turned around and occupied the entire square. We need to talk about mature nodes chips 28 nanometers and above. I know, it doesn't sound sexy. It's not as cool as AI chips. But this is the bedrock upon which our world operates. Think about it. Your electric vehicle has thousands of chips. 
Your power management systems, your IoT devices, the robots in factories, and even the control chips inside missiles, they don't use 3 nanometer chips. They use these mature nodes. In this domain, China is staging a blitzkrieg. According to Western analysts, China now possesses the world's most complete capacity system for mature nodes. I'm not saying this. This is a fact admitted in Pentagon reports. And in the equipment sector, the breakthrough has already begun. If you look up names like Nora, Northern Huachuang, or AMEC, Advanced Microfabrication Equipment Incorporated, you will find data that makes competitors very uneasy. In the field of etching equipment, for processes of 14 nanometers and above, China's localization rate has already exceeded 60%. Even in film deposition, a field Japan was once so proud of, Chinese equipment has entered SMIC's production lines and begun mass production. The craziest part is back-end equipment, like cleaning and CMP, chemical mechanical polishing. On 28 nanometer production lines, the Chinese localization rate has surpassed 80%. What does this mean? It means that for the 70% of the market that represents the largest global demand for chips, China is gradually achieving de-Americanization and de-Japanization. Remember that analogy I used? Japan owns the spices. But the plot twist is, China hasn't just learned how to make the pots. They've started planting their own spices. While these spices might not meet Michelin three-star standards yet, they are perfectly adequate for a hearty home-cooked meal, and at half the price. Even Peter Wenink, the former CEO of ASML, recently admitted publicly, If you force them to solve the problem through their own efforts, they will eventually do it. This isn't just a technological catch-up, it is a victory of market logic. And this is the point Japanese media most easily overlooks. China is using its massive domestic market, the world's largest EV market, the largest 5G market, to provide these domestic equipment makers with the most valuable resource of all, the opportunity to fail, trial and error. No industrial equipment can improve if it isn't used. Japanese equipment is great, sure. But if you don't sell it to China, Chinese equipment manufacturers will take those orders, make the profit, pour it back into R&D, and iterate better products. It is a simple commercial feedback loop, but many geopoliticians choose to ignore it. Now let's zoom out. What does this mean for the future? There is a horror story here that Japanese media is unwilling to face, the risk of the lapagosization. The logic of Japan and the US is, as long as we cut off the high end, China will suffocate. But China's logic is, as long as I have the market, I can survive and gradually climb upward. The current reality is, yes, in the high-end sector below 14 nanometers, China is indeed struggling. High-end lithography machines, EUV technology, high-end photoresist, these are still pain points. We must be honest, the gap exists, and it is wide. But, and this is a huge, but, Japan views this gap as permanent, while China views it as temporary. History tells us that technological blockades usually have two outcomes. Either you completely strangle your opponent, or you force the creation of a much scarier rival. Just like the GPS blockade forced the creation of the beta navigation system, and the exclusion from the ISS forced the creation of the Chinese space station. The current trend points, once again, to the latter. Imagine, five years from now, China not only monopolizes the global market for low to mid-range chips, which is a massive cash cow, by the way, but also through brute force engineering and state-backed investment, slowly grinds away the gap in the high-end sector. At that point, what will Japanese companies face? They will find that their biggest customer, China, has vanished. Not only that, but this former customer has morphed into their biggest competitor, starting to sell similar equipment and materials on the global market at lower prices. You have to realize the Chinese market used to contribute 30% to 40% of the revenue for Japanese giants like Tokyo Electron. Without this massive profit support, how will Japanese companies maintain the billions of dollars in high R&D costs required annually to keep their technological ecological dominance? Once the R&D funding chain breaks, the technological lead is lost. That is the real crisis. This isn't just about chips. 
This is about a complete restructuring of the global supply chain. We are witnessing the birth of two parallel worlds. One is the high-end loop dominated by the US, Japan, and Europe. The other is a massive ecosystem dominated by China, covering all foundational industries. And the irony is, it was the Western blockade that accelerated the birth of this parallel world. Originally, Chinese companies were used to buying ready-made Japanese equipment. Now, they are forced, or rather, incentivized, to buy domestic. So, back to the question at the start. Japanese media says China cannot cross that wall. Maybe they are right. The barriers of physics are hard to break. But they might have forgotten one thing. When you are building a wall, your opponent is building a ladder, or even building an airplane. Technology is never a static treasure chest. It is a dynamic river. If you try to dam the river, the result is often that the flood changes course and washes away your own levees. This isn't just China's story. This is a story about how human innovation explodes under pressure. So, I want to leave this question to you. Ten years from now, when we look back at this history, do you think Western sanctions locked down a rival? Or did they single-handedly create a giant they can no longer defeat? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. This is definitely worth a heated debate. If you enjoyed this analysis of looking through the noise to find the signal, don't forget to like and subscribe. Stay sharp, stay curious. I'll see you in the next one.